Before coming here to Gig Harbor, my last call was in rural southwestern Minnesota. Especially at this time of year, I'm, rem I'm reminded that there's a lot that I don't miss about Minnesota. I don't miss the choking humidity of the summers, or the hordes of bloodthirsty mosquitoes, or the flat, mountainless horizons. I don't miss the two weeks of mud between when they turn off the church boilers for the, for the summer and when they turn on the church air conditioners. But there is one thing I miss very much. I miss being around the farmers. Every Friday, I would go to the, the town hall in Swift Falls, Minnesota, a town of about 75 residents, and I'd sit and I'd have coffee with the local farmers, most of whom were members of the congregation I'd served, Shepherd on the Hills, Shepherd of the Hills, excuse me. They'd sit and swip, uh, swap stories and jokes. They'd tell tales of trips taken and memories of years long past. They'd also talk shop, the price of corn and beans, the repairs they made to their equipment, or how much great rain they'd gotten or expected to get. A lot of that was well above my head, but I still learned a lot in those morning conversations. It reminds me of a story that the rabbis tell. There were two brothers who spent their entire lives in the city. They'd never seen a field or a meadow. The brothers decided to take a trip to the country, and on their trip, they observed a farmer plowing his field. They were puzzled. What on earth is he doing that for, they asked. He rips up the ground with these deep, ugly cuts. Why would anyone take such a beautiful green piece of land and destroy it like that? Then they saw him sowing grain in the furrows. Look at this madman, they said. He takes good wheat and throws it away, burying it in the ground. The first brother spat in disgust. <sighs> Only crazy people live in the country. I've had enough. I'm going, to, I'm going home to where people are sane. And so he returned to the city. Like the first brother in the story, we non-agrarian types sometimes think of farmers as crazy, as simple or unsophisticated. Living in Minnesota, I saw day to day that farmers are anything but. They're inventors and innovators and strategists. A farmer can take a welder and a table saw and fix a broken multi-million dollar piece of machinery or create a tool for pennies that would replace something that retails for hundreds. Farmers teach themselves to program GPS computers in their combines and how to read the fluctuations of crop prices on the foreign markets. And farmers are master strategists. They have to be because they know that they cannot make what they plant grow. And so they have to observe and plan and theorize to get the best possible yield from their crops based on what they know taking into account predicted weather patterns and soil chemistry, the prices of commodities, and a host of other factors. Any one stroke of bad luck, a hailstorm, drought, a flood, a drop in the price of corn, a shortage of seed or fertilizer, and everything changes. And so, they have to have strategies for all of those things, too. And those strategies change from year to year. That's what the second brother in the story learned. When the first brother left to return to the city, he stayed. He watched as the grains sown by the farmer sprouted first into green shoots and then ripened into golden stalks of wheat. He was so awed by this incredible change that he sent a letter to his brother in the city telling him only that he would have to come and see with his own eyes if he was ever to believe what had taken place. So the first brother returned to the country and was delighted with what he saw. And they both began to understand the purpose of the farmer's work. The farmer's strategy seemed at first to be lunacy to the two brothers. But in time, they came to see that what seemed like wastelessness, wastefulness and stupidity actually turned out to be a well-thought-out strategy. This is what the farmer in the story knows, what the sower in the parable knows what Jesus knows. 
that sometimes preparing for the harvest takes an act of faith. What farmers understand, perhaps better than those of us who have never worked the land, is that we cannot create the harvest. In Jesus' parable, Jesus says that we are meant to understand the seed as the word of God, the gospel message. But what then is the harvest? Is it more word to be sown and shared? Is it the fruit of repentance in the hearts of the people who hear it? Is it the kingdom of God itself, God's reign of justice and peace? Maybe it's all of these things. Whatever it is, Jesus seems to be appealing to the wisdom of that farmer. That as we share this message, we cannot make or force any of these things to come about. That is God's work and God's work alone. We cannot bring them about any more than we can create wheat from nothing. But we can create the opportunity for those things to grow. In the parable, Jesus describes the different types of soil as different types of people. Such a reading often invites us to consider whether we ourselves are good soil or not. We even have a hymn that we sing about it, right? Lord, let my heart be good soil. It's an idea worth exploring as we read this passage, but so is the idea that our own hearts might actually be fields in and of themselves, filled with many different kinds of soil. Perhaps we all need to hear the word in different ways, not just through our corporate worship, for example, but also through individual spiritual practices, or by living it out in our daily lives, or experiencing that word alive in others, or hearing the stories of others' experience of that word. If we neglect one or more of these strategies of sowing that seed in our hearts, we may be missing out on the fuller harvest of God's word in our own lives. The rabbi's story continues when the farmer came with his scythe and began cutting down these beautiful golden fields of wheat. The first brother, the one who was impatient, was once again flabbergasted. How insane, he said. He's worked for months to produce this lovely wheat, and now he's destroying it with his own hands. I'm disgusted with this idiot. I'm going back to the city. In this COVID time, we have had to cut down what has always been the center of our lives together as a community, our corporate in-person worship. Different congregations have responded in different ways. Many, including us, have taken to meeting online, such as we are now. It's not quite the same, but it's something. Others have been meeting outside or doing drive through worship service in stations or sitting in their cars in the parking lot listening to the service over the radio. When we do eventually come back together, we will need to consider how that meeting will be changed by social distancing rules or our inability to sing together or by having to limit how many people can come at one time. Along with that first brother in the story, we may think that these things are completely insane, totally opposed to the entire idea of what worship is. If we cannot be in person together, sharing physical contact and raising our voices with one another in song, then what are we doing? If we can't share the body and blood of Christ in a single room, eating the same loaf and drinking from the same cup, will it be enough? With our corporate worship as we knew it gone, I wonder if this COVID time of quarantine and social distancing can be an opportunity for us to think about how we are sowing and tending the fields of our own hearts, our own spirituality, how we are using different strategies to sustain ourselves in this time. Our worship online is important, but as I said, it's just not the same as being here all together in one room. Perhaps what this time is teaching us is that in order to help God's word take root in our own lives and in the world around us, in order to prepare for the harvest of God's kingdom, we need to be farmers, strategists, working out ways that uh, we can sow these fields in other, besides just in our corporate worship. 
things that are bigger than that. Perhaps more now than ever, we ought to be thinking about how we can spread that seed more broadly in our own hearts so that God can bring about an abundant harvest. This might include things we've never considered before. Perhaps we may take up a practice of daily prayer or acts of service or almsgiving, donating to causes or organizations that are dear to us. I have a friend who's chosen this time as a time to fast from alcohol in order to help himself experience it in a different and more spiritually fulfilling way. In this congregation, we created social clusters so that during this time, we might give ourselves the opportunity to connect with our neighbors and our friends in a way that we never have before through phone calls or Zoom chats or letter writing or what have you. It's always been my hope that we can use this time of isolation to actually help deepen the relationships that we have within this congregation and to appreciate even more the people in this community to which God has called us. It is this, uh, excuse me, this is especially personal to me as I embark on my sabbatical tomorrow. Serving this congregation has been fulfilling in many ways over the last five years but it's also left me drained in others. I'm realizing that I have not been as attentive to my own spiritual health as I need to be, that if I am to continue being the best pastor that I can be and being a healthy Christian, I need to find new strategies to nurture that health. So I'm going to be spending this time sowing seed, hopefully finding some personal spiritual practices which will produce a harvest in me enough to sustain me through the rest of my career. I hope that this practice of Sabbath rest and some intentional spiritual and professional development will help me return to you in October, not only with new energy and better spiritual health for myself, but also with new tools and insights to help this congregation as we together imagine where God might be calling us through this. Maybe this is a time for each of us to be doing the same, to be sowing that seed in our own lives. At the end of the rabbi's story, the first brother returns to the city, but the other one once again waits to see what will happen next. He watches as the farmer skillfully winnows the grain, separating it from the chaff, and gathers it into his granary. He marvels at the amazing harvest he collected a hundredfold what he began with. And he thought to himself, turns out there was a method to the madness all along. <laughs>